All right, so we're picking back up in our series on human government and going through a lot of the Old Testament law to see what the Bible preaches on different subjects of, of setting up a government. The first sermon I preached just kind of explained that there's power that God has given to mankind to be able to establish government. And I'm going over a recap because last week we had a break from, from the series and just to get everyone up to speed. Uh, you know, first sermon, I was just explaining how there's different powers that God has given mankind the power to be able to establish a government, to be able to enforce laws um, and, and to be able to carry out sentencing where normally you don't have the right to just, you know, beat somebody or put someone to death or whatever. That's not something that God has given you the authority of, but he has given an authority to set up a system, a government to be able to execute that type of judgment upon uh, upon people when they commit crimes. So uh, I've been going through various things. We went over all the crimes that have to do with a death penalty. And one of the purposes for this is just so that we can have our minds set right. Obviously, we live in this world. There's a lot of other things that, that happen outside of church. We live in a world, there's, there's government and, and how it's supposed to be set up and, and you know different levels of involvement that people might have. And I think everyone ought to know what the Bible teaches on this stuff and how we ought to have our system set up to that would be a righteous government, a righteous way of, of delivering justice and having judgment. And, you know, if we can have a, a, a government set up that's based off the Bible, then praise the Lord, it'll be a good government, it's a good, a, one that's going to provide the most freedom. So this whole series kind of stemmed from the subject that I'm going to be preaching on this morning. And I know I've brought this up before, and uh, it, it stems from an incident that happened when I was in Jacksonville preaching there weeks ago, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But the, the topic for the sermon this morning has to do with um, crimes involving children and parental rights. This is a, is a, is a hot topic today. Because there is a lot of infringement on the power that God has given to the families, to the parents of children in raising their children and really putting them. God, see, God has, has, has created different realms of authority. There's the authority within the local church, right? God has given uh, um, authority for churches to deal with situations, for churches to handle things. He's also given authority at home in the family for, for uh, the husband to be the head of the household, to be in charge of running everything within your family. And then there's also the, the institution of a human form of government, which is another authority that uh, God has established for there to be, as I just mentioned, the carrying out of sentencing and, and, and finding, you know, punishing the evildoers, right? Now, at the head of all of these realms of authority, there's God. And there's God's authority, and he's the one who determines what's right and wrong. And obviously, ultimately, only God's authority, you know, nothing can supersede or, or circumvent God's authority. So the problem that we have, though, oftentimes is that people try to get outside of their own realm of authority. And with government, it's a big problem. Because God has given government the authority to, to punish evildoers. Not to dictate every last little detail of your life and tell you how you can live and what you can do, what you can't do just in general on just making choices. It's supposed to just prevent evil coming upon other people because of your actions, right? And it's supposed to just be able to punish people from doing that. It doesn't even, the law doesn't even, isn't designed to prevent you necessarily, you know, per se, from, from doing things that can harm someone else. It's just, if you do do things that are going to harm someone else, then you're going to get punished for it. And that is, therein lies the prevention. But it's not like, you know, the government's job is to just do like pre-crime and just prevent you. Well, I think you're going to do something bad, so we're just going to lock you up right now anyways. Right? That's, that's not the role. That would be going way outside of the realm and the scope of, that God has given of the authority to government to be able to, to um, make judgments. So when it comes to children, this is, this is a very um, personal for everybody that has children. It's a very um, important topic. 
because we have a government that seems to think that, you know, everybody belongs to the state and that everyone is just kind of property of the government when that's not true at all. That's right. And God has created us. We belong to God and we answer to God. OK, government serves a purpose. I'm not anti-government. I'm not one of those like Romans one talks about those that hate government, those that despise government. Right. I don't despise government, but I, dis I despise wickedness and I despise wicked governments. But the governments that God sets up, I, I like justice. I like judgment. I like when someone has something wrong done to them, when justice prevails, when, when people are punished for crimes. I like that. And I want to live in a society where we can have that and where things are done rightfully. So that if someone steals or murders or robs or rapes, they pay for it. Amen. And they pay justly. I don't want there just to be no government. I also don't want there just to be a free-for-all of just people just deciding for themselves what they want to do and how they want to carry out judgment. No, it needs to be established and there needs to be a rule of law. So these things are all very important. As Bible believers, as Christians, though, if we're going to determine what's right, what's wrong, what is just, what is the scope that government should have, what is the level to which, you know, we should give people a grant authority and, and intrude into our lives or whatever, all of these things need to be determined from the Bible, from God's word, because God has already given us the details on that. We don't, we're not left questioning. We don't need to come up with extra philosophies and axioms and other principles of things that's out of man's heart coming up with their own virtue and their own, well, I think that this is right and we'll go back to Socrates and we'll go back to Plato and we'll go back to these great philosophers and thinkers because they've established all these great principles. You know what? All I care about is what, the, what God says about these things. Now, they may have some good ideas or whatever. If, if they line up with Scripture, great. But if they don't, I don't care about it. Because their ideas aren't better than God's ideas. The, even, you know, the, the founders of our country, whatever ideas they came up with, if they contradict the Holy Bible, they're inferior. Bottom line. So we get our principles, our ideas, what we, uh, what we believe government should be from Scripture. And people don't like that these days because they don't like the judgments and the punishments that God has instituted against certain crimes. But that's too bad. I mean, if you love God, you ought to love the law of the Lord as well. Amen. I mean, the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And we believe that here. So you're going to hear some preaching today out of God's word that's going to help us to determine what's right and what's wrong. Now, when it comes to crimes involving children, I was going to, we, we went over this when we went over the death penalty crime. So if you look at verse number 16 in Exodus 21, where we started, the Bible says, And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. So, yes, kidnapping is a crime, but it's not just a misdemeanor or a felony. This is a crime that is just capital punishment. Someone is, is stealing a person, stealing a man. And this doesn't specify, you know, a child. We tend to think of like kidnapping being children. Obviously, this can be a grown adult, too. This would apply to anyone. If you're going to go and steal somebody and you try to sell them or whatever, even if you don't try to sell them, you just go and steal a person, or in the Bible, you know, you ought to be put to death. Now, we're going to get in the parental right thing a little bit later, but, you know, it's ridiculous to say that a parent can steal their own child. Yet, we have a government that thinks that because the child doesn't belong to the parents, it belongs to the state, that you're just like a custodian of your own child, but they can determine where your child's going to live and who, who's going to raise them and everything else. And that is wicked and wrong. And I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but that is, that is a big focus that we need to have set straight today and what our attitude is and what our view is on what's right and what's wrong. Because I'll tell you what, there is not one instance in the scripture of God 
taking away and saying, you don't have the right to raise your child anymore because I don't like what you did because you did this or you did that to them. So we're going to go and take them away from you and give them to someone else. Never one time. Completely unbiblical principle. And, you know, people get to this point because they look at it and go, well, yeah, I mean, if he's doing that, I, I don't think he should be able to raise it. You know, and you could have those feelings. But the thing is, when you're setting up laws and rule of law, we ought to follow God's method. Because, yeah, people do some bad things out there, some bad things in the world. And people ought to be punished for the bad things that they do when a punishment is just. But trying to, to determine, you know, and remove the realm of authority that God has given to you, unless God has put in there something where he's taking away that authority, it, you can't just go and do it. And God has given to, to, to men, you know, to, to families, the, to parents, the right to raise their children. And that the children belong to the parents. Now, uh, look down in verse number 22. That's for kidnapping, right? Verse number 22, we're going to see God's protection of the unborn. Verse number 22, the Bible reads, If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. Now, why does it matter what the woman's husband says? Because the woman's husband is the father of the child, and he has authority over his, you know, that's obviously something that's very personal to him, but it also just goes to show the, that it's not just the state that's involved here. It's not just the government. I mean, the father's involved here because he was the one that, that, that had um, his child killed. Now, when it says here, no mischief, it basically is, is, is another way of saying that it wasn't intended, it wasn't premeditated, it was an accident, right? So when they say, okay, something bad happened, someone, uh, a, a woman gets, gets, unfortunately someone knocks into her, and then a child that's in her womb dies. If, if no mischief follows, if it wasn't intended, he says, there's still a punishment. Why? Because it's a life. Because somebody died. Because it's not just a fetus. It's not just whatever term you want to put. It's not just a group of cells. There's a living human being inside of that mother's womb. And there's a soul in that womb. And we don't believe this ructardation that says that a person's not a person until they breathe their first breath or whatever it is, that nonsense, they don't have their soul until they breathe. That's ridiculous. Okay, God forms and fashions people in the womb and they exist, they have souls. And that's why the Bible says here in verse 23, if any, man, if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Because the only balance to that justice, if someone intended to kill the child in a mother's womb, he says, you give life for life. So yes, the life of the, of the adult person that killed the child, the value of their life holds the same value of the life that's in the womb. It's not a lower life because, oh, that's not even born yet. Oh, it, it needs all this, this help to be able to be sustained and to live. And, you know, it doesn't matter. The life growing inside of a womb that can't survive outside of the womb has just as much as importance as the life of a person that's in a hospital that's on life support that whose body can't function to keep itself alive. They hold the same value because they're both alive, because they're both people, because they're both created by God. Amen. Okay. If any mischief follow, they should give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So it doesn't matter. Burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Whatever happens to a child, we're going to mete out the same punishment against the person responsible for that. Why is this important? Well, why is this important? It's because we have people whose job is to go and murder babies and to go into the womb and kill and murder innocent life. And according to our laws, it's legal. No problem with it whatsoever. The Bible says you give life for life. And if we had a biblical government, these stinking abortion doctors down at their abortion clinics ought to be put to death. Amen. They ought to be hung up high and shot 
because they are the most despicable people on this planet. How can a person go in to the most defenseless creature in the world, a, a living human being inside of a womb, and go in with tools and utensils and, and stamp out that life, you wicked, murderous, you know, filthy person? You deserve the death penalty. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. And, you know, God cares a lot about the children. God cares about the innocent blood. When innocent blood is shed in the land, and we get this teaching, I don't know if I went over this very much, over the death penalty aspect when I preached on the whole, all those crimes of death penalty. God requires blood. When blood is shed, especially when innocent blood is shed, God requires that blood be shed. And you know what? If it doesn't happen, if that justice isn't executed, God's going to make sure that justice comes down. And you know what? If God has to come down and execute the judgment, it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be fun. And a lot of people are going to be impacted by that. This is another reason why it's important. You say, well, I don't go out killing babies. Oh, of course, you better not be going out killing babies. But we need to scream about this and shout about this and teach people about this and try to get to the win over the hearts and minds of our people. Supposedly, we have the power within this nation to change our laws. Right? I mean, we've been given this luxury of living in a place where it's supposed to be a, a government that's run by the people and for the people. If that's the case, then, then hey, let's, let's, let's work. Now, look, I don't think that politics is the answer to all of our problems. I used to want to get really heavily involved in politics. Reaching the hearts and the minds of individuals, I think, is way more valuable because the more people you can get on board, the more people you get saved, the more people get right with God. The, 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 the better off it is in general. But I, I, there's still a place for it. There's still a place in general. It shouldn't be our primary focus. It's not where we're going to get all of our, you know, solutions from. But if you have an opportunity and you could get involved in something, let, let's at least try to bring things back to a biblical model. Because God's going to bring judgment. He will. It's going to happen. This blood cannot be shed day in and day out without judgment coming. You look at in the Old Testament, in the book of Kings, under the reign of Manasseh, and all the innocent blood that was shed. He was a king that, that had his children. He passed his child through the fire under Molech. He worshipped false gods, and they did human baby sacrifices. And the amount of innocent, innocent blood that was shed, that even when Josiah came and was getting the country back right again and, and doing all kinds of great things for the Lord, God said, you know what? It's still, it doesn't even make up for everything that was done. There's just been too much innocent blood shed. Judgment's coming. You can't avoid it. He was able to postpone the judgment, but it just gotten too bad. Our laws matter. And when, when it's allowed to have all this innocent blood being shed, you know, I can't imagine that God has, is, is not already just fed up with the United States and saying, it's already too much. Amen. What would be great is to see these laws overturned and changed. I know it's starting to happen in some areas that they're trying to introduce them. I don't know all the details on it. It's encouraging to see it, but... Sometimes you, you see these headlines and it's just kind of put out there to, to appease a segment of the population that has their head screwed on straight and they kind of hope that you don't really dig into it because you, oftentimes these laws and the harpy laws and everything else, they don't have any real teeth to them and they kind of end up being more for show than anything else. And I'm not saying it's the case with everything, but... Um, be aware of this. You know, a godly people is not going to stand for this. And, and if we're going to have a godly nation, we can't stand for this either. But, uh, you know, I kind of went over this a lot still during the, um, the death penalty sermon. So let's, let's keep going here. Flip over to chapter 22. Because God really does care for the innocent life. He cares for the unborn. He cares for the widows. He cares for those that don't have anyone to stand up and protect themselves. Exodus 22, verse number 22, the Bible says, You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword, 
and your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. So God is, God's given them a warning here. He's given the children of Israel a warning. He's saying, you know what? If you're going to afflict the widows, if you're going to try to take advantage of the widows and the fatherless child and those that are helpless, those that don't have anyone to advocate for them, and you think you could just have an easy target and you can do whatever you want to these people because they're poor, because they're fatherless, because they're widows. He says, if you do that and they cry unto me and they call out to me, he says, I'm going to kill you with the sword. Judgment's coming straight from God. He's like, I'll take care of that. And you know what? I'll make sure that your children are fatherless. I'll make sure that your wife's a widow if you're going to go and do this. So, so I'm bringing this up because God cares a lot about children, about fathers, about, about the helpless people of this world. So it's not to understate when we go through, you know, other passages and and where the government should step in when it comes to crimes against children. But we need to first just have this understanding of where God's coming from. Okay? Turn, if you would, now to Proverbs. We're going to look at Proverbs chapter 13. Because even though God really looks out for these people, God has also established a form of discipline within the household for your children. And it's not child abuse. And people today would have you think that corporal punishment, that disciplining your child, spanking them with the rod, is child abuse. And, and that, is, that push and that agenda has been going on for a while. And we need to be aware of this too because the Bible teaches us how we ought to raise our children and how we ought to discipline them. And I don't know about you, but I want to do things God's ways because you know what? God's ways are right. God's ways work. God knows what's best. If the creator of human beings says, hey, here's how you raise a child and here's how you discipline them, I think he knows. Right. He's the one who made us. He knows what's going to work. And if it doesn't work, you're probably not doing it right. Proverbs 13, verses, verse 24, the Bible reads, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him, chasteneth him betimes. Betimes means early. You need to get in front of it. You need to be able to, to discipline your child early. It's not just discipline. It's not just saying no, no. It says he that spareth his rod. The rod has a purpose. And it's not this, this guiding rod of just kind of moving them from one way or another. The rod is rod right back there. <laughs> Being used for the very purpose that it's intended for for the correction of children, you might get a, uh, a more clear picture in Proverbs 23. Turn to Proverbs 23. I'm going to read for you from Proverbs 19, verse number 18. The Bible says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. The Bible says, yeah, when you discipline your children, they're going to cry. And look, no parent likes it when their child is in pain or when their child's crying. Nobody likes that. It's not pleasant. That's why the Bible says don't spare because of it. Because it's not pleasant, the, 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 the response might be, oh, I don't really want to do that anymore because I, like, I don't like it when they cry. I don't like when they're, you know, I, I don't like that, so I'm not going to bring forth the discipline that's necessary. But the Bible says don't spare. Don't hold back. They need it, so give it to them. Yes, sometimes it's unpleasant, but it's a necessary evil. It's something that you need to do in order for your child to be raised right. Proverbs 23, verse number 13, the Bible reads, Withhold not correction from the child. And now we're going to get the definition of what the correction is. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Amen. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Now, don't get freaked out by the word beat. I know oftentimes we think it's like the first thought that might come to your mind when you hear about a beating. You might think about someone getting beat up, right? Like with fists, black eyes, broken bones, bloody noses. That's not what the Bible is talking about here. And, and look, this just takes the, the level of discernment of like a first grader. Okay, this isn't that hard to figure out. 
You could read the whole Bible. We don't see violence being done to people and being instituted as just like, yep, this is what you guys are going to live. It's just going to be survival of the fittest in, in my home. And if you can make it out alive, then, then you're doing good. That's not what, he's, what was being taught here. When you have a rod, the word that's being used is just is a beat. I mean, it's, you're inflicting a little bit of pain on the, the padded end of the child that was designed to receive that type of punishment. It, 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 it doesn't require a lot of explanation. It's pretty self-explanatory. However, the Bible does say to beat him with the rod. It's not a little, a little tap. Okay, it's, it's not some, some light thing. They need to be able to feed it, feel it. We need to be able to spare not for their crying. And the Bible is saying, look, he's not going to die. They may sound like they're going to die. Sometimes they freak out. Ah! It just, it's like, what? Are you dying? They're not going to die. Okay? They're being dramatic. Now, now, we ought not to injure the child at all, ever. I mean, that's not, that is not the purpose. The purpose, and you've got to remember, the you know, purpose of discipline is to correct them and to teach them. And this is why also this verse says, Thou shalt be in with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Why does it bring up hell? Is that going to save him? No. I mean, obviously he needs to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to, to literally be saved from hell. But what it does is it teaches children that there's consequences for their actions. Amen. And when you have a generation of people who grow up without being spanked, without getting that punishment of actually feeling some sense of physical pain that, that goes hand in hand with them doing wrong, doing evil, doing bad, it's harder for them to understand the reality of hell because if it's driven into them from an early age that, hey, when I do bad, there's actually a physical bad burning sensation that, that goes along with doing bad things. It, at the very base rudimentary level, is going gonna, is gonna to tie in and associate to their brain, when I do bad, there's a bad punishment that's waiting for me. And this is an important truth to drive home because it's a fact that when we sin against God, he has a judgment. He has a fiery, burning judgment to, that, that is the price of our sins. So when we sin against God, we deserve that punishment. But even just understanding that can bring us to the point to acknowledging, I need a savior. I need someone to save me. Right? And that's going to deliver our soul from hell. So when we, when we discipline our children, it gives them that understanding. And uh, it's extremely important. Now, again, people will try to tell you, you know, you can't do this with your child because that's child abuse, because they're crying. Look, God told us to do it. We can't allow people to, out, to act outside of their realm of authority and push their opinions on us on how we raise our children. Now, should you be, you know, abusing your children and injuring them? No. No. And, you know, that ought to be a crime of, like, hurting. Because, I mean, just as much as it would be if you, if you just injure and hurt someone else, I think that should apply to your own children if you're going to, you know, knock their tooth out, you know, just, you know, whatever. You do something that's, that's really bad. Yeah, you ought to pay for that. And there's proper punishments for that, too. But there's a big difference between discipline and abuse, right? And, uh, and, that's, and that's what, you know, this is also why you need righteous judges. To be able to judge, to be able to determine what is appropriate, what is right, and what is not right. Turn, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 3. This is actually a, a really important passage that gets to the heart of, of um, the concept we have these days of, of governments taking children away from their parents. And this is a great example of someone who had a lot of wisdom, King Solomon, in dealing with the situation with a really bad mom. Really bad mom. And if you want a situation where you have... You have Someone who's just, un, you know, people today might say they're unfit to parent. They're not a good parent. So you've got, we've got a story here of a prostitute, a harlot, 
who has a child. And she's living with another whore. Two prostitutes living together and they both have children and one of those children dies. I, I mean... That's not a very, that's not a very uh, family-friendly household. That's not a very good place to raise a child. I agree, it's not a good place to raise, it's not a good environment. And if you think of a situation, you know, people might be inclined to go, well, we need to save that child and get him out of there, but hold on a minute, hold on a minute, you don't have that right. right. And we're going to see what's written here because on the one hand, we have nothing in Scripture that ever says it's okay to just take children away from their parents, even bad parents. And then on the other hand, we actually have a story of someone who, has, who had more wisdom than anyone else in the world to that point, giving judgment here and being praised for his judgment on what he did in this situation. And I believe what he did was right by God. I mean, I don't think there's any other way to even interpret this or understand this. But let's start reading in verse number 16 here. Bible says, then, then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O, lo o my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also. And we were together. And there was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. So basically they have children three days apart. So they're both basically the same age. You know, you know, it's hard to tell a difference, not like one's way older than the other one. It so gives a story. We two live in this house. There's no one else there. It's just us. So it's these two ladies, and now they're two newborns. Verse 19, and this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. So she lays on top of this child. The child dies or whatever. It's, it's overlaid, suffocates, dies, right? Horrible situation, right? It's a tragedy. Not a good situation at all. Obviously, bad environment. I mean, you've got, you've got this prostitute that's just overlaying her child and killing it. Really bad environment. But then she, the story continues here. She, she continues on the story. It says in verse 20, And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. So she swaps the kids and, and you know, I'm just going to pretend like, like, she killed her own child, and I'm going to take that one because I want to have a baby, right? This is what she's thinking. And then in verse 21, it says, And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And so the mom's looking at it going like, I know my child. You know, moms are looking at their, at their children and inspecting them and just loving on them when they have their babies. You know, they know their own child. And she's like, this isn't my child. This isn't the child that I gave birth to. And verse 22 says, And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, the living is my son. Thus they spake before thee. So then they start arguing and say, No, that's not true. That's me. The, the one that's alive is my son. And there's arguing back and forth before the king. Verse 23 says, Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O my lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. What a, what a rotten attitude to have, right? To, to be able to say, nope, this is what's fair. Just split it in half. And, and So obviously what Solomon's doing is showing wisdom. He's, he's identifying because the mom is going to care about her child's life, even if it means her own self-sacrificing of losing that child for the benefit of the child. Right? For, so whatever she can do so her child doesn't die. But the one who, that's not her child, and the one who killed her child already anyways, is just saying, no, it's good. And it says, then the king answered and said, give her the living child and no I slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. You know, if this story happened today, you'd have someone going, call CPS, and we're taking all the kids away. Because, you know, this happened and, and this prostitute, obviously, she, if she's living with this woman, she shouldn't have that child. And, 
and it's already a bad environment and one child died. Do we see Solomon saying anything like that? Saying, take that child away from that prostitute. Take that child away from that woman and put her in the, the, the orphanage and they're going to be given to a foster family because this woman's unfit, because she couldn't even protect her own child in her home. Do we see this happening? No. No. Things happen in this world that are bad. Real bad things happen. But when you have freedom you have the freedom to do right and wrong now the wrong should be punished no doubt but in or you, you could never restrict people to the point of having no bad things ever happen people have this bad mindset of saying well if it just saves one life then it's all worth it is it though now I'm not I, I hold life in very high regard but let's take that statement to its extreme and saying, well, I mean, I guess what if everyone were then just locked up in a prison? I mean, because then you can't do any bad to anyone else, right? If everyone just had your own cells and your movement was just completely restricted and we had someone just come and bring you food and you're just all locked up and you just stayed in your cell all the time. I mean, wouldn't that save lives? It would save at least one life. It's all worth it, right? No, obviously, obviously that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. There's risk involved with everything. Just driving to church this morning, you took on a risk. Someone could have smashed into you. It's raining. Well, that's even more risk, right? We live in a life full of risks. That's why we can't just go nuts with thinking you're going to save every single person in this world from bad things ever happening to them. And that's why we need to just get what we believe from God's word because he's already spelled it out for us. So, but, but see, the people who want to push these agendas, they, they feed on emotion because it's very emotional when so a child's lost. And this is the way they do with all the gun control laws and everything else. Anytime there's a tragedy and someone loses their life and children die, they want to they act on the emotion and going, oh man, this is horrible. We don't ever want this to happen again. Yeah, everyone I think would agree to that. We don't ever want this to happen again. Nobody wants to see these, these, these wicked things happening, but the, the, the solution isn't just to, to try to... to Bring in more force of just forcing everybody to not have stuff, to not have freedom, to not have, you know. You're never going to be able to prevent bad things from happening completely. And it's not, it's not the solution. And, and you don't have the right. And that's a whole other thing. I'm not going to get into Second Amendment stuff and right to defend yourself and everything else. That's a whole, that's a whole other topic. We're talking about just the right of parents to be able to raise their children, to raise them the way that God said and, and that... You know, other people and the government doesn't have right to just take your child away from you, even if it means that, you know, even if someone's not in a good situation. Okay, not in a good situation, but if a crime happens, then punish the criminal. But you can't do this pre-crime of removing yeah. children from their house. Hey, if, if dad does something bad, then yeah, he ought to be punished for it. And, and you know what? If, and if we had God's judgments in place, then you wouldn't have to worry as much about children being around the bad people because if they're really bad people, they'd be put to death. They'd be executed. Instead of taking the child out of the situation, let's take the, the offender or the pervert or whatever out of the situation and just put them to death. That solves the problem. Now let's get into, this is important to understand these principles from the scripture because now I, want, now I want to bring up where this hit home for me and I'll tell the story of what happened when I was in Jacksonville because I went there to preach with my family, right? Preach at Steadfast, Jacksonville, 
and we decided to take a little bit of extra time and do a little family vacation and we rented out this place that was right on the beach it's middle it was january so it's like winter you know we got a good deal on it so we're able to go and uh, and stay right on the beach and the kids had fun playing in the sand or whatever and um we're there just enjoying the day great day sun's out everyone's having fun kind of wrapping things up we lit the, the place was literally right on the beach so like we're going up to the condo so we're make trips up and down there's a balcony you can see the beach and everything and i'm going up and down the stairs where it was just trying to kind of packing up so at the end of the day my wife's already up she's got the baby and um and jonathan right so one of the boys i'm left down there we've got the three older girls and david and david's done he's ready to go back upstairs i can't just send him to go up on his own so the girls are playing in the sand right and i say okay i'll let you play a little bit longer stay right here i'm gonna go bring david up so i bring him up to the room but of course He's full of sand and the wife's nursing a baby. So it's like, okay, well, I got to deal with him so he doesn't just get, make this huge mess. Put him in the shower. I'm upstairs for about 10 minutes. And all of a sudden, Abigail comes in and says, there's a, there's a police officer that wants to talk to you. <laughs> Great. So I go downstairs. And of course, I mean, you know, you know how cops are. They always want to tell you why you you're bad and you're doing something wrong you know whatever so i'm just like okay well what's going on well we received an anonymous call that uh you know someone was 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 digging in the dunes or something like that i'm like okay now i'm not from florida i was unaware that that you know that the the conservationists and and the nut jobs have gotten so crazy with their with their their land protection <laughs> that apparently on the ocean there's a, there's a little dune and then it goes into this, this land that's just overgrown with just like grass and weeds and whatever and sand and nowhere you'd really want to go anyways, but like all of that land is protected. All of that land is like, like you can't go even walk in those areas because it's like a federal offense. I think there's like federal laws and state laws and like all this crazy stuff on, on this and what my daughters were doing is they were up on the dune, still like on the beach, but up on the dune, and they were digging and digging holes and, and burying themselves, you know, doing what kids do in the sand. And there was like no signs anywhere, so I had no idea that this was even a problem at all. And, <laughs> which, which is a whole nother problem. Someone decided to call the cops on three little girls playing in the sand. <laughs> First of all, what is wrong with society when you see girls playing in the sand and you think that the, the appropriate action is, let me call a man with a gun to come out here and deal with these little children that are playing in the sand, as opposed to like maybe going and talking to the parent and saying, hey, maybe you didn't know, but they're, you know, they're not supposed to be doing that. No, they call the cops. So the cop comes out, but... He says, we got to call for this. He says, but that's not even a problem. He's like, that's not a big deal. He's like, the real problem is that, you know, we've got a law here that says, you know, that, that has a, a, a child neglect law in the state of Florida. And I'm going like, what in the world? He's like, you know, we have a lot of drownings. And this is a real dangerous place to just leave children. And he said, they're 10. And, he and he's like, we've been here for five minutes. They said that you've been gone for 10 minutes and you've been gone for all this time. And so, you know, it's like, hold on a minute there, guy. I said, you know, first of all, when you approached, when you came here, because I said, I, you know, he's, he's trying to say they're going to drown and it's real dangerous. And we're going to get into the, what their law says in just a minute because they're trying, he's trying to establish that this is just a dangerous situation. That I'm like, it's child endangerment for my children to be playing in the sand on the beach. I said, first of all, when you came here, were they right up over here on the dune playing in the sand? He said, yeah. I said, that's exactly where I told them to stay. So it sounds like they listened to me pretty well. 
and didn't just go run off into the ocean when it was already chilly and they'd already been in the water. We're done with that, right? And I said, I, it's not like I was gone that long. You know, and, and then here I am trying to have to defend myself against a cop because he's threatening uh, to, to, you know, cite me or find me or arrest me on some law that's on the books in Florida where you could charge me with a crime for going upstairs with my child and leaving my daughters, you know, way away from the ocean. And I was like, look, nobody wants my children not to die more than me. So yeah, I appreciate you care about my kids and you don't want them to die, but guess what? I don't want them to die more than you don't want them to die. They're my kids. And I don't need a government, a big brother to look out for me and to help me out when I'm trying, when I'm raising my children and I'm raising them right now. You may have to deal with a lot of other people that don't care about their kids and may have problems, but you know what? I'm raising my children and I'm raising them right. And it's none of your business. If I'm leaving my child here for 10 minutes or 20 minutes or an hour, it's none of your business. That's my child. Now, if I end up harming my child or doing something to my child that's, that's, you know, I ought to be punished for, that's a different story. But there's no victim here. Nothing has happened. Nobody is hurt. Nobody's injured. Nobody's in danger. They're not like you found them swimming in the water and, and they were like drowning and, oh, what happened? Where's that? You know, that wasn't the case. They were playing in the stinking sand. This is what, their, what the law says for neglect of a child. Because this is, and, and mind you, this is under their child abuse laws. Child abuse. So this cop's threatening me basically to charge me with child abuse because my children were playing in the sand for 15 minutes without me being right there. Here's a law. It says, a caregiver's failure or omission to provide a child with the care supervision and services necessary to maintain the child's physical and mental health, including, but not limited to food, nutrition, clothing, shelter, supervision, medicine, and medical services that a prudent person would consider essential for the well-being of the child. Boy, that's not ambiguous at all, right? A prudent person, essential, you know, supervision. Where do you draw the line on any of those things? Because I asked him, I said, well, how old do you have to be? But you could still, you know, and he's like, well, it's like 12 to 14. I was like, oh, hold, hold on a second, though. I said, wait a minute, because he gave me a range. I'm like, if it's a law, then don't you have an actual age that says they can't be left alone at this age? You know, it's like, don't tell me you've got this law. And then he's like, well, it's 12. You know, it's like, yeah, you just told me a range. And now you're telling me it's 12. Then why didn't you say it was 12 before? He's like, well, there's different discretion. It's, you know, it's stupid stuff. Yeah. And ultimately, these, these, these cops just get on their high horse and want to, they, they think they're perfect. And they want to tell you why you do everything wrong and whatever. Now, obviously, I didn't get charged with anything. And he's saying, you know, well, I don't want to ruin your vacation. And, you know, it's, and, and here's the other thing. If you really thought that there was like something serious going on here, wouldn't you have just then arrested me? But no, you got to feel the need to like go and lecture you on something. I was like, what's the point? Obviously, there wasn't anything really bad going on here. Otherwise, you would have arrested me. Right? I mean, if, if there was something really, if there was a problem there that was like, oh man, this guy's definitely breaking the law here. Wouldn't you just think that if he had any integrity, he would just arrest you? That, so then what's the purpose if you show up and you don't see a real problem just to go and lecture somebody, right? But that's a whole other story. It doesn't matter. That's, that's just a, an actual, just a personal thing. So that is what the law states, neglect of a child. Here's what is the, the punishment for that crime if, so, if they find you guilty of neglect of a child. So in my case, it was supervision. I right? understand, well, you weren't supervi supervising your child. 
All criminal offenses in Florida charged as neglect of a child are classified as felonies. All are classified as felonies. Where the neglect or abuse does not result in great bodily harm or permanent disability or disfigurement, the charge is a third degree felony. So that would have been the case for this because, yeah, there was no bodily harm at all, let alone great bodily harm. It's a third degree felony with penalties up to five years in prison or five years of probation and a $5,000 fine. Justice, right? They could have put me in prison for five years and a $5,000 fine for not supervising my police state much, you think? And then it says where great bodily harm occurs, the charge is a second degree felony punishable by up to 15 years in prison or 15 years probation and a $10,000 fine. A conviction for neglect of child may also, also negatively impact parental rights or result in a complete loss of parental rights. And this gets down to the heart of the issue because the government does not have the authority to determine who has parental rights because the rights of a parent are given to the parent by God. Amen. Who do you think you are, O vain man, that says you have the right to usurp God's authority and giving a parent the rights of their own child and say, well, if we just determine you don't, you're not fit parent, you don't have any more parental rights, as if the government's the one that we go to and say, please give me some parental rights. I want to raise my child. Will you please let me raise my child? No, we don't go to you for our rights. It's not a privilege by the government that we are allowed to be custodians of our children. God is the one that gives us, the Bible says, low children are in heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. God gives us children as a reward. God gives us the fruit of the womb as an heritage. That means it's an inheritance. It's people that come after you by virtue of God giving them to you belong to you. When you have an inheritance, it's something that passes down to you, that belongs to you. It's children are that heritage. They belong to you. These laws are extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. They, they get instituted when bad things happen and get fed on emotion because no one wants to see bad things happen. But we got to go to Scripture and have a level head when we deal with these things so that, you know, especially when, when laws are being determined and, and we want to know what's right, so that we don't step outside of the scope and the bounds that God has given and given for a very good reason. There's a very good reason for, their, for, for God to have the parents responsible for their children. It's because nobody is going to care for the child more than the parents anyways. When the Bible talks about the, um, you know, the hireling that's going to flee from the sheep, saying he's not the shepherd, he's just a hireling, he's just going to flee because he's a hireling, because he's just paid to be there, whatever, it's just a job. You know, when, when people... At work, you know, if someone, armed robbers come in and they want to rob a place, go ahead, have all the money. I don't care. It's not my money. Whatever, right? But if an armed robber comes into your house and you've got your family there, you know, I would think you're probably going to want to do whatever you can do to stop that person so they don't hurt your family because you love your family. Right? right? Someone breaks in. No one is going to try to defend my kids more than I am. Nobody is. I don't, care. I don't care if you have a badge. I don't care if that's your job to, protect, to serve and protect. You don't care about my kids more than I care about my kids. You don't love them more than I do. That is a natural, normal thing. That is how everybody is. You care about your kids because they're your kids. And God has given you the right to raise your children as you see fit. And you know what? Not everyone's going to see eye to eye on how you raise a child. But that doesn't... And, and, you don't like the way someone's raising their children. You don't have the right to just take them away from that person. That's 
Now I'm going to close on one principle of just dealing with police or people that are contrary because this is the way I ended up dealing with the situation because I could have escalated the situation because I, I, you know, I, it, it burns me up when you've got you know, stupid laws and then stupid people trying to enforce their stupid laws when there's no reason for it at all. And I don't like to just back down on everything, you know, when someone's going to come and tell me that, like, you know, I can't do this and I can't do that with my children and my family and I'm not hurting anybody. So, yeah, I started talking back to, to the cop and telling him, you know, I don't, I don't need Big Brother. I don't need you watching out for my kids. I'll watch out for my kids. But there comes a point where I think it's wise to not, you know, what, what good is it going to do? I can fight and resist. If I fight and resist that cop, he's not going to change his mind. He still thinks he's on his high horse and he's going to show me, you know, whatever. If it were to go to court, then I have to show up and drive back down and then they're going to be, you know, and all those other things are going to happen. And for what good? They're just going to drop the charges anyways. They're just going to drop it. It's going to be like, yeah, there's no case here, whatever. The cop's not going to care. He's not going to get reprimanded for, for doing that because they say, well, he's just doing his job. And everyone's asking, he's just, so no good is going to come out of any of that. That's not the right fight to, to have over these types of laws and things like that. And, you know, even the Bible says in Matthew 5, verse 25, it says, Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. So I had an adversary in the way with me. And trying to tell me, oh, you're a so you know what? At the end of the day, you just go, okay, thanks. Thanks for informing me. Thanks for letting me know. Thanks for, you know, I'm going to agree with you. Okay, you're right. Thanks. And go away because if I don't, I'm going to be cast into prison. And then they're going to have it out for me because whatever. Now, Obviously, there's, there's a time and a place for everything and for civil disobedience and for resisting, but you, you have to see the big picture too, right? And, and what, what impact is, is certain fights, aren't, they're not even worth it. That fight for me is not worth it at all. Not on that level. Not at that point with that officer. That, that's not going to accomplish anything at all. There's no... Even legally, there's no, there's nothing that's going to happen. Because like I said, they'll dismiss the charges and then I just wasted a bunch of money and time and everything else trying to, trying to deal with it. But we ought to have, you know, a good balance and understanding because there's, you know, I'll tell you this much. I'm not going to agree with my adversary if they're trying to inject needles into my kids and shoot them up with poison. Right? I'm not going to agree with my adversary if they come and just, and just overstep their bounds so much that they're going to you know, inflict harm or something like that on me and my family. Not going to happen. There's definitely a point at which you resist and you resist hard. But we need to be wise with when, when those situations are and deal with it appropriately. And you know... The more people we can educate and to get on board and get right with God, the better off we will be overall. Even if the politicians are all just crooked and corrupt and, and they only listen, if they listen to their constituents, if they listen to the voters, if we impact the most voters to be a righteous people, they can still be wicked, but at least still their feet will be held to the fire a little bit with, with their constituents all wanting something you know, one way and having to, okay, well, this is what I got to do. And they can move to some other state and then they can be as liberal as they want to be and, and, you know, whatever. But if you can get a group of people and get focused on that, that's where I think the true power, because the power comes from the Word of God and the Word of God can change the hearts and minds of the people. That's what we're going out and, and, and really focused on and trying to do. But having a good understanding of laws and how they ought to be able to is important as well. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the wisdom that you give us from your word. I pray that you would please just um, help us to, to have discernment. I pray that you would um, help us to reach people so that we can reach more hearts and minds with your word. God, help us to be good examples. I pray that you please 
keep us from evil and allow us to continue to do the work that we're doing uh, without being molested by the government and being able to just do uh, your work, God, that, that um, we will be free to, to exercise our religion and to, and to reach people, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.